Welcome to Johnny Walker Meets Phil Collins. Over the next two hours, Phil will be discussing his life and career in a candid and fascinating special. It's been a busy time lately, reissuing his solo back catalogue, writing his autobiography and his decision to return to the live stage. We'll be discussing the early family life, the acting, the music, the hits and the misses, his inability to say no to work, marriages and divorces and dealing with the tabloid headlines. Above all, as one of the few people to sell more than 100 million records worldwide, Phil goes through his amazing solo success, winning an Oscar, meeting royalty and playing with his heroes, including The Who and Eric Clapton. We begin with You Can't Hurry Love. That was You Can't Hurry Love by Phil Collins. We thought we'd start with a bit of an up song. Okay. And the early years, you loved Motown. You used to follow this group called The Action mm -hmm. quite a bit. Yeah. Oh, The Action were, um, were my heroes. And actually, uh, I got a chance to play with them at the 100 Club a few years ago now. But they reformed and I'd gotten to know them because I'd helped fund uh, a video that they did in the lap of the mods. And I also funded a book that they were going to put together because, you know, I wanted to read it. <laughs> so I thought, <laughs> might as well pay for it. And so we became friends. And Roger, the drummer, who was a huge influence on me, huge influence, uh, is, is one of uh, great friends of mine now. So talking of the book, you've written one. So it starts with you going to see a medium. And you, you mentioned, I think, I'm writing if I remember, because it's a big book. It is a big book, actually. Yeah. I mean, it looks like a book. The first time I saw it, I thought, oh, thank God, because, you know, some of these things can look a little bit cheap and nasty. But, but the publishers are great, and um, they have a lot of confidence in the book, and I had a great time writing it. Did you write it all yourself, or did you? No, well, no. Craig McLean, who is, is a freelance journalist, lives in London, he and I had met many times for interviews and always got along very well. And um, the last interview I did with him, he said to me, uh, you know, if, if ever you want to write a book, I'd love to be involved because, you know, I like you and we get on. And I had been thinking, I mean, you know, since the 90s, really, that I would do something myself at some point. And uh, I started, I did this Alamo book, A Collector's Journey, which was something that was very close to my heart, you know, the Alamo in Texas, and I was collecting lots and lots of memorabilia. And I decided, well, I was asked, actually, to, to write a book about it, which I did, but it took a lot of work because it's historical. So you've got to get that right to start with. I really enjoyed writing, instead of writing lyrics, just writing these stories. Every piece of equipment that I'd collected all had a story. So I, after I finished doing that book, after I finished writing that book, should I say, I started to, I carried on writing and, and I started work on the book, my book. And I, I wrote a lot of the early years. That was the stuff that was, was fun at first. And then I got to the music and I, I kind of glazed over a bit. You, yeah, you say writing about the early years was fun at first. You mean until you got to writing about the music? Yeah, it was the early years that were I found fun. Family recollections, the early years of visiting the marquee, you know, things like that. It was when I, it's when I got to join Genesis that um, I kind of stopped. Let's talk about the early years and the influence of your dad, who didn't think much about music, did he? No, I mean, it's funny. We, we all were involved in some shape or form in, in this Richmond Yacht Club. Um, well, Converted Cruiser Club and Richmond Yacht Club was what it was trying to be called at one point, but I think uh, there is a Richmond Yacht Club. So we, there's my uncles, it was, it was my mum and dad and a few other friends that love boats, you know. I mean, I'm talking about love motor cruisers, you know, not yachts. And we always used to have shows a couple of times a year and everybody just pitched in. I mean, my dad had this comic routine, uh, which is unlike anything that you would suspect he had if you read the book. Was he proud of you and all you achieved? Well, he never saw anything, you know. That's the trouble, really. I mean, he came to a Genesis show once. Well, let's go back. I mean, my brother 
it was a cartoon, it still is. My sister was an ice skater and she's an agent now. Um, my mum did the same thing. You know, she ran a toy shop, but then she ran an agency for kids. He was hoping that I would go into the office, which he tried to get my brother to do, tried to get my sister to do. But um, it wasn't going to happen. It was the 60s, you know, everything was changing. My dad tried to run away to sea, which I didn't know until my brother told me, at the age of 19, to become a merchant seaman. His dad brought him back, you know, by the scruff of the neck and said, don't be so stupid, you know, you're going to go to the office like me, which is the London Assurance in the city. So maybe my dad was always a little bit of a frustrated... Well, I'm sure he didn't want to go to the office every day, but he did for 40 years until he retired and then he died. But then isn't it funny the way he tries to repeat the mistake, really, to get his own sons and daughters to go in the office? when he would have loved to have had the freedom of joining the Merchant Navy. Yeah. I think looking back at it, there may have been a bit of jealousy on his part that we were all getting the freedom that he never got. I mean, Clive did go into the the city for a very brief period and then escaped, and and Carol did the same thing. She escaped. And for me, I, I, I never went there. I just went straight into music with acting. And he he didn't. I don't believe he particularly liked the music of the 60s. Not many of the parents did. No, I mean, you know, that was... <laughs> Part the, of the good thing about it. That was the whole idea, wasn't it? Yeah. But he did come to see Genesis once in the 70s at uh, a pub in Southall, and uh, I'm sure he looked at it and said, what the hell is this? I mean, I remember the gig, and I remember at that time we, we would rehearse things but want, and want to play them, but they weren't finished, so... There would be some shambolic little periods, and Peter would be <laughs> not singing real lyrics. And I'm sure Dad must have thought we were all crazy. And he died Christmas of '72, just after we'd come back from the first Genesis trip to New York and and Boston. So I don't know even if that would have done it. But he was a bit, a bit sick by that point. So he never saw anything anyway. He never saw that I was kind of not right or wrong, but he, he never saw there was a, a future in it. The song All of My Life is about him or about you, or a bit of both? Uh, a bit of both, really. Certainly there's a verse about him, which is um, playing records upstairs while I watch TV, which is one of my regrets now. I think one of the, the big things, I, I mean, I'm... We all think that parents are going to be around forever. It's only as you get older that you realise, of course, mortality. But when you're a kid, you just think they know everything and they're going to be around forever. And I was 21 when he died. And I think I was angry. When I look back at the book, you know, I think I, I was angry at him leaving so soon. And... I sent the early chapters uh, when they were being written to my brother just to make sure, you know, to see what he thought. And he came back to me and said, you know, it's lovely, lovely, but you're being a bit hard on Dad, aren't you? And it made me think that uh, maybe I was, and uh, I kind of looked at it again and and edited it and rewrote some things. But it is a big issue in the book, I guess, because it keeps recurring, you know. I mean... uh, He wasn't given an opportunity to have an opinion on whether I was doing well or not because he he didn't see any of that success. Phil Collins and All of My Life. So suddenly you've decided you're back. You're going to do shows next year at the Albert Hall. They sold out in about 15 seconds. It's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, it's very good. I was very impressed with it. Very pleased. Yeah, well, I, uh, where do we start this? Uh, should we start with Nicholas? We can, yeah, we can do. I mean, Nicholas has been playing drums since he could stand up. How old is he now? He's 15 now. Right. And, of course, you know, I've, I've got five children. I've got Jolie at the top. She's 44 with a daughter, my granddaughter. There's Simon, who's 40, who, who is ploughing his own course with his CDs and his 
his band and his kind of progish rock and doing very well, very proud of him, but, you know, he's a fantastic drummer. Lily, of course, is doing um, very well as an actress. Matthew's a superb football player, captain of his team. But being back with, with Nicholas and Matthew and just being constantly aware that they would like me to do something. I remember taking them to school before they moved to Miami and they'd always want to hear my music or Genesis music. And um, Matthew, who's now 11, he would say, you know, when are you going to write some new stuff? And uh, I kind of avoided it because I had an excuse. Taking him to school, didn't want to get involved in an album, or certainly not a tour. But Nicholas, as he's grown up, was going to be a fantastic drummer. And we did, after one aborted show last December, we rescheduled it for March, and we did it, which is where the... Um, the thought of the book starts, you know, me having problems with the hearing again. And he was going to play drums on a couple of songs. And then we rehearsed these couple of songs. And he, it sounded so good, I put another couple in. And he learnt those. And the audience loved it. And the band loved it. All my guys, you know, have been with me for years. Then we did a couple of shows uh, in June with him playing drums. And it just kept sounding better. And And really, at that point, I think... Tony Smith and I, who's my long-time manager, we decided to, why don't we bite the bullet and do some more live work. Just going back, he's 15. A couple of years before that in your life, as a 13-year-old, you get to play the Artful Dodger on the West End stage in Oliver, which was a bit of a problem about school. So you had to go and see, uh, I forget his name. But Mr. I, Hands. Mr. Hands. I call him Mr. Mean, really. It's a typical <laughs> sort of headmaster. <laughs> Frightens you to death. You had to have a conversation with him about whether you could do this acting job. Yeah, I don't know why my mum and dad didn't do it. But anyway, I, I went to his study, you know, which, which meant one of two things. <laughs> yes. You're going to get a cane in or you're going to get a cane in. It's quite a sweet story, actually, because he, he was a ruddy-faced man and very stern-looking. And I later found out that he lived very close to Reg and Len, my uncle's. And when I last saw Reg alive, I went to visit him. And he said, uh, of course, you know, Mr. Hands. I said, yes. You know, with fear in my, on my face. He said, do you know he lived near here? I said, no, I had no idea where he lived. You know, as far as the farther I could be away from him, the better. He said, you know, he was a big fan of yours. After you left to do Oliver... He decided to follow your career quite closely and was very proud of you. And I just sort of thought, oh, my God, well, how lovely. I'd love to have met him again. He's dead now, of course. Anyway, yeah, I went to see him. And I, by this point, I'd got the job as the Artful Dodger. And he said, um, well, congratulations, but I'm afraid you can't stay here and do it because of the education rules at the time. So... Uh, I went home and said to my mum and dad, um, well, he said I can stay and not do it or leave and, and do it. So my mum and dad said, OK, well, we're going to leave, go to the, a drama school, and then you'll be able to do it. So that's Well, that was I, pretty lucky. Other people's parents might have said, no, no, school comes first. Yeah. You can act well, later I, Well, on. in theory, I was going to a drama school that was going to educate me. Yeah. In fact, I went to a drama school that didn't educate me, but... Well, you did learn quite a lot because the ratio of boys to girls was very much in your favour. Yeah, I learnt some things. <laughs> I didn't learn the things I was supposed to learn. Then you got onto the set of uh, the Beatles film, A Hard Day's Night, and you're actually in the film, or not in the film. Not in the film, no. But you were filmed. I was there. Yeah. Yeah, this was the early days of the drama school and we all got sent down to uh, the Scala Theatre in Charlotte Street up in the West End and no-one knew what we were doing, you know, as, as, as was normally the case, you know, if you're an extra. So they herded all of us together and other kids from different stage schools into a theatre and nobody knew, but I knew, I recognised the Beatles' drumhead, which was kind of, you know iconic and lo and behold within a few minutes they 
ran on stage and started playing through some of these hits. The idea was to get everybody performing Beatlemania. But I just, you know, I just wasn't interested. I just wanted to listen and watch. I, you know, I, I, when I went to see the film, I mean, I, I wasn't looking for me. I mean, at that particular part of the, which is the end of the film, I, you know, I was thinking I must be there somewhere, but I saw some friends. So anyway, 30 years later, Walter Shenson, who was the, the producer, he came to me uh, and he said, I hear you're in it. Uh, I said, I told him the story and he said, oh, I'll send you some outtakes. And then he said, would you narrate the making of A Hard Day's Night as you were kind of related to it and you can act a bit, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I did that. But one night I went through frame by frame by frame these scenes and I found who I think was me sitting down, not doing Beatlemania. <laughs> so in, in, the, in, the, in the DVD, I circled myself, you know, just a bit of vindication that I was there. <laughs> Here's one of the songs that have sung. The Beatles and Tell Me Why. Our guest is Phil Collins here on Radio 2. So you never got to meet any of the Beatles then, and you never got... You, you'd have, what you wanted most of all was to touch Ringo's drum kit because he's a bit of a hero of yours. Oh, yeah, well, Ringo... The Beatles were and still are in my opinion, one of the fantastic band songwriters. I mean, the production, Jeff Emmerich, George Martin, you know, what they did on those records, it was groundbreaking and also in, in a lot of instances still got to be bettered. But, uh, yeah, of course, I, I, you know, I didn't meet any of them and I think the next time I came into their orbit would have been um, With All Things Must Pass when I got this phone call to uh, to come down to Abbey Road and play percussion on something. And I got there and there was Ringo and, and George and Phil Spector. And that story's too long to tell now, but it is it is in the book. I, you know, I finally got to tell it properly, you know, because it's a funny story. And needless to say, though, that I wasn't on that album either. <laughs> I was cut out of that <laughs> as well as... Uh... Joining Genesis, what amazed me was reading about Hedley Grange where you go to record, and it sounds fantastic. Oh, this mansion in the country, that must be a lovely place to go and just make an album. But from your description in the book, it's very different. Well, either Zeppelin or Bad Company had been there just previous to us to do this kind of, you know, mobile recording unit and or just, just rehearse and write material there. But they'd left the place in a bit of a state and... Uh, at one point, it was a lovely house, and it probably is now. But then there was more rats than you'd like to see in one place, and it was pretty grim. And we wrote The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway there, uh, and we were there for a considerable amount of time. You probably had the worst room. Yes. I mean, there's all these public school toffs in Genesis, <laughs> and there's young Phil. Um, it was a bit like that, yeah. I mean, it was a bit like that most places, actually. <laughs> Tony, Mike and Pete would um, get there a day or so early, you know, just to sort of set up the lie of the land and get the best rooms. And I would arrive on time. And I, I Jolie was very, very young at that point. And uh, I was with Andy. It's your first wife. Yeah. And all I can remember is at night hearing all this scuttering around above and below, which were sort of rats doing their thing. And, and you'd sit out in the garden and you could watch them climbing up the creepers. I mean, it was the most uh, awful place, especially for a young family. Because when Peter left and they put an advertisement in and you spent quite a few weeks auditioning for singers, you would do the backing vocals for these auditions, would you not? Yeah, well, we were starting to write what would become a trick of the tale. And every Monday we would put it down as half a day of auditions. So we'd invite like you know, six, seven people down. And it was my job to teach them the songs. We wouldn't do the whole thing, but we'd do a bit of Firth of Fifth, a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of the other. And I, it was my job to teach them. And it, it, it was a bit of a hard task for the people to learn it in time. They're not particularly easy things, but sometimes you can tell very quickly if someone's got it or not. Anyway, we went through a lot of people, 
But over a period of a few weeks, it seemed that I started to sound a bit better than anybody we were auditioning. But that really didn't bother me because I was the drummer. That was my place and that was where I was going to stay. But we ran out of time and couldn't find anybody. We, we took, and so we had time booked at Trident Studios in London and we went in there. We went in there with one guy uh, who we thought might make it and we did all the backing tracks and then we invited him in to see if it made it. And uh, it didn't really, you know, it wasn't his key. It was an, un, you know, these things actually matter to singers. You know, is it my key? No, it's too high, too low, whatever. We, d we didn't think about that at that point. You just had to get around it. So we did it and then he left. And I said, uh, oh, give me a go. I'll have a go. Uh, I was already going to sing a couple of softer songs, I think. But nobody really thought I could do anything ballsy. And um, I went down there and, and started to sing. And suddenly, you know, the, Tony and Mike looked down at me and, and Steve, you know, and was like, hey, this sounds like it could work. So and that's what we did for the whole album. The big test was that the ballsy one was squonk, was it? Yeah, exactly. That was a song that uh, this guy had tried to sing and I went down to sing. That's Squonk from the Genesis album, A Trick of the Tale, a sort of um, test as to how well you could do as a lead singer. But the thing is, there were big shoes to fill. Peter Gabriel had these flamboyant costumes, did these mm. crazy stuff on stage. and You're not your average rock frontman, are you? No, and that didn't escape other people's attention either. <laughs> I don't think any of the band thought this was going to go any farther than it had done. We were looking for a singer that had charisma and could do something. What did you think? I, I was confident that I could sing the songs. I mean, obviously, I'd just sung the recent songs, the new songs, but I, I was confident that I could do the old stuff. But I really had no ambition to be singer. I really didn't want to come out from behind the drums. I felt I was a much better drummer than singer. Is it shyness and introversion a bit? Because the drummer's always safe at the back, isn't he? Yeah, you can well, hide yeah, behind you know, the got kit. The security blanket, of the kit. Yeah. But we had another look to see if we'd miss someone in the tapes. There was some point which I can't remember the actual tipping point, but it might have been Andy, my wife, that, that said, uh, "Why don't you do it?" And I, you know, I thought, oh, no, I couldn't possibly. But we talked about it, I guess, the band, and said we'd try it. Now, I have no recollection at all of the rehearsals, which is kind of strange. I mean, I've got a very good memory, but I have no recollection of rehearsals. What I do remember is saying that if I'm going to be trying this, I need a drummer that I can trust and, and, and you know, I admire. So we got Bill Bruford, who had just left Yes, and he was pre-Crimson and pre-UK, uh, the bands that he went on to. But he wasn't doing anything, and, you know, he and I were mates. So suddenly I had a drummer that might fill the shoes, you know, and we went from there. And I remember the first show, of course, it was in London, Ontario. That was pretty... I mean, the day leading up to the show was pretty terrifying because one of obviously one of Peter's strengths was to talk to the audience and regale them with surreal stories, something which... I didn't think I could do. So that's what I concentrated on, singing the songs. That was easy as far as I was concerned. But as soon as we went on stage, the audience reaction was really, you know, it was going to be OK. It might take a while to be good, but it was going to be OK. And um, I think that was mainly because I come from within the band and it wasn't accepting someone else Instead of Pete, it was actually accepting someone that was, had always been in the band anyway. And it took you a little while to start um, to, to get brave enough to yeah. remove the mic from the stand, start moving around a bit. Yeah, it did. I think there was one song, Robbery, Assault and Battery, which I put on a hat and coat for because it was kind of Dodger, Artful Dodger Land. But um, 
Oh, yeah, it took me a long, long time. I mean, you can, if you see Genesis footage up until at least 78, 79, I'm still singing with the microphone on the stand, <laughs> you know, as my security blanket. Yeah. So how come you started making solo records? Well, you know, the, um, the amount of touring we were doing really just fractured my marriage. And um, when that broke up and we'd not long moved into a house near Guildford, I set up a little studio and just started to channel my energies into seeing if I could write songs because Andy had left for Canada and I went there to see if things could be patched up. But by the time I come back... I mean, I actually left Genesis at that point. Um, I did say to Tony and Mike, I think this is the end for me. I'm going to Canada to uh, patch the marriage up. But I couldn't, you know, that didn't change. Nothing really changed the, the result. So by the time I came back, they were doing their first solo albums. So that was, I knew that I had a fair amount of time before they'd be ready to do anything because you've got to record it, mix it, you know, put it all away. So I started to write songs, started to learn how to operate the studio. And during that year of doing that, these doodles became songs. Lyrics came very easy because they were songs from my heart. But I still didn't think it was an album. I, I was just occupying my time. It was only when Armit Erdogan and Tony Smith, my manager, heard the cassette that I had that they said, oh, this, is, this is great, You've got to, this should be an album. And uh, then I thought, oh, God, I can't do this all again because I'd spent a long time doing these demos. And um, that's when I decided to use my demos as the finished thing. So face value was my demos with new drums, some real singing as opposed to doing it in the studio with a good microphone, and uh, overdubbing other musicians. In the air tonight, I mean, you changed the whole drum sound of music for the entire 80s, really, with that. And there was this expression, this gated mm. reverb. So was it an accident how it came about, how it often is? Um, I don't know, it wasn't an accident. I think I spent a lot of time with Peter during some of this dark period. He didn't have a drummer. He didn't have a band, actually, because he couldn't really afford to keep the American musicians that he had live. He couldn't afford to keep them day after day. So I said, I'll play drums, you know, I'm doing nothing. So uh, I spent a, a, you know, a couple of months with him at Ashcombe House, where he lived. And when we went into the studio to do his third album, it's where I met Hugh Padgham and, and Steve Lillywhite, and I was in the, the townhouse, which has got Goldhawk Road, I think it's gone now, and I was in the drum room, tuning up the drums, getting... They were getting a sound. I had headphones on, and I was, I was hearing this sound develop as I was playing. So he was playing around with noise gates on, on the... which basically, make, instead of going... the drum went... Dzz. So as I was playing, I would hear... Dzz. Dzz, 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 dzz. and I, I kind of started playing this pattern, which was... Which was kind of hypnotic, and Peter Gable, he put his hand on the for talk back and said, "What's that?" I said, "I'm just playing with the sound." He said, "We'll, we'll do that for ten minutes. Nothing but that for ten <laughs> minutes, which is a long time as a drummer if you're doing just that." Because so, the other thing is, because they can talk to you, there's sort of intercom between the studio cubicle and where you are, but there's also a microphone that picks you up so they can hear what you're saying, and it's that drum sound that they heard through that microphone and I think, wow, this sounds amazing. Well, I think I, it, was the, it was the mics that, we, that they'd set up, but they'd set, you know, Hugh and Steve Lillywhite had put them in the corners of the room. It was, just, it was a stone room. And actually, you know, I went back there many times 
and it's actually not very live. But if you put the, the mics, because it's stone to start with instead of acoustic material, you can play around with it. But the long and the short of it is that that sound is really born on Peter's third album. But when I'd finished playing 10 minutes of... I said, what are you going to do with it? He said, I don't know yet. I said, well, can I have a copy of it? Because I kind of feel this is mine. And he said, OK. So anyway, I got a copy of it, which I didn't really do anything with. But he gave me a credit on Intruder, which was the first track on the album. So, you know, there's been a kind of this thing, who, who, whose sound is it? It was me in the studio with Steve Lillywhite and Hugh Padgham, and when I went back, when I decided to make my demos into an album, I asked Hugh Padgham to do it, and we didn't really go into that same room and say, let's do what we did with Pete. We just played around with the drum sound, as you do. I mean, even if you try to create, recreate it, it's impossible. It would always sound different any other given day. So that's how the sound came about, the gated reverb. I mean, it is incredible, the power of it. Yeah, it still sounds really great, actually. It's 35 years old. I know people were surprised they'd never heard drums that loud on a record, really. But the sound of them, I've still got those drums. And part of it, I'm sure, is the drums as well. Did you mind seeing a gorilla do it on TV? No, no. Did it make you laugh? Yeah, I was very flattered. I mean, they called me, well, they called the office, you know, and then eventually I got the word that Cadbury's wanted to do this advert using in the air tonight, which I thought, OK, with a gorilla playing it. And I said, well, OK, good luck, kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, I saw it. I mean, I living in Switzerland, I didn't see it quite as much as maybe viewers in England did. But what I was impressed about is they did a special edition for the rugby that i thought was uh, was kind of you know that was cool and all of your albums have been remastered they're back on release and... yeah here we took all the artwork again and uh, each album has a second cd of live material that's relating to the album so that you can see how the song's developed. Let's talk a bit about you working with other people. When Keith Moon died, were you hoping you might get a call? No, I was hoping. I wasn't expecting it. I did some work with Pete Townsend at Oceanic, his studio in Twickenham, which, coincidentally, was the same building, and again, it's, there's a picture of it in the book, was the same building that my mum and dad and me and my brother and sister would go to for our boat meetings and uh, you know he, of course he, he bought the place and made it into Oceanic and I sent him that picture and he was very emotional about it but uh, you know I was working with him one day there and I said you know if you, if you have problems with finding people someone to work with the replace Mooney you know I'd, I'd love to have a go and he, he said to me oh well, we just asked Kenny Jones who had played a few times with them when Keith was a little worse for wear. But the, uh, you know, it was, it would have been a, a great gig for me. One person you did work with on his August album was um, Eric Clapton. Yeah, we met in 1978 and John Martin introduced me to him and I lived quite close to him. So I, Patsy t took a shine to me as well, his wife. And so I used to go over there quite a lot. He, I don't know if he knew I was a musician. I was just a pal of, you know, someone that Patty liked and John, you know. But he came to see, I, I don't know if it was me or Genesis now, he came to see a show at Hammersmith. Patty dragged him along and he suddenly realised that I was a musician, singer, blah, blah, blah. So then kind of the, you know, we started playing a little bit together. The big thing was when he called me, uh, I think it must have been 1983, to um, ask me to produce an album for him, which, of course, you know, was something I never, ever expected. And that 
album was Behind the Sun. And uh, we, we went to Montserrat to do it. And it was, we had a great time. He had Duck Dunn there from the MGs, you know, Chris Stainton from the Grease Band. These guys were playing with him all the time. Jamie Yeldacre was playing drums. I, I was just producing. But it, it was great fun, great fun to do it. And then I did another album. But uh, with Behind the Sun... He got taken away by the record company because they, there was not enough guitar on the record. And these are songs, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd let Eric, well, what, you know, where do you want to play? But they, they weren't happy with that. They wanted a guitar solo. So they took him away and did two or three other songs with lots of guitar on. And then um, that was my first encounter with record company meddling. Never had it before or since, actually, with Genesis, my, my stuff. But... Um, Eric called me, after this all happened, Eric called me one day, my album was finished, and he said, I've got one more song for the record. I said, well, everyone's gone home. He said, yeah, but I, I want it on a record. I said, OK, well, where do you want to record it? He said, I'll come round now. <laughs> so, he, <laughs> so he came round with the guitar, and I'm thinking, this is a bedroom with studio, with just my little eight-track material, equipment in it. And he played it to me, and it was lovely. It was called Behind the Sun, and it was just him and him and his guitar. So he said, we'll plug the guitar and let's get a sound and we'll do it. And I'm thinking, I've got Eric Clapton. You know, suddenly, I wasn't his producer and friend. I was, I was kind of, you know, the 15-year-old kid at the bus stop hearing Cream play. And I said, OK, plugged it in, because I work on my own, you know. And plugged it in and you got a sound. He said, yeah, that's, that sounds good. So we, we recorded the song. And then he said, OK, I'm going to sing it now. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking, God, I haven't even got a good mic here, really. Anyway, he sang it, first take, and he said, that's, that's great, that's what I want. And I put a little bit of strings on it, because you're just in the very, very distant bag. Anyway, so that ended up being the last track of the album. And it was kind of nice to, to finish it that way because the, I felt the album had, had, had been taken out of my hands and gone to L.A., you know. My love has gone behind the sun. Phil Collins is our guest here on Radio 2. Let's talk about 1988 and your acting again. And you get offered this role to play Buster yeah. in the film about the great train robbery. And the fact that Julie Walters is going to be in it must have been a big plot. Oh, that was a huge, uh, a huge thing. I mean, I love Julie Walters from the comedy stuff she'd done on English television, obviously. I, I knew her from Educating Rita. I mean, she lended credibility to the, to the film, as far as I was concerned. And so I said yes, because it's a period of the 60s, I, I love that. And we had a lot of fun recreating things from the 60s and making sure that everybody had their little eye jubblies, you know, the, the frozen orange juice. You know, that was something we made jubblies. But, yeah, it was great fun to do. Julie was, was wonderful to work with. Because they, the they wanted you to do songs for the movie. Yeah. And you weren't keen on that. You wanted to be, well, I'm acting here. Yeah, I just didn't want, you know, I wanted to be taken out of that world and put in a different world so people wouldn't be sitting there waiting for me to sing. And um, that worked. I mean, I, I did say I, I got, what about Lamont Dozier, you know? He wrote with Holland Dozier Holland. He wrote classic songs from the 60s. So I got hold of him. I actually just met him on the um, No Jacket Required to... And uh, he said, sure, man, this, is, this sounds great. It sounds like great. So we met in L.A. where he lived, and uh, I told him what we needed. And he, uh, within a week, he'd come up with... He sent me two demos. One was um, a really kind of Martha and the Vandellas. And the other one was... Um, He'd called Loco in Acapulco. He 
he, he came to Acapulco and, and, and with these demos, I mean, I, I said, this, these sound great. So I wrote the words for Two Hearts almost overnight. And I went back to his room the next day and I, you know, played it and sang it. And he says, that's it, mate, it's your song. You're going to have to sing it now. How did a groovy kind of love come about? Ah, well, um, I said to the, the director and producer, I said, where I'm saying goodbye to Julie, because we were, we were trying to pick songs that kind of pinpointed the era. But then they were on in the background on the radio or something. And I said to them, wouldn't it be nice if there was some kind of romantic song on the radio when Buster and Julie are saying goodbye? And I mean literally on a radio, that kind of quality. So they said, yeah. What, what kind of thing do you mean? I said, well, Groovy Kind of Love was a hit in, in that era. Maybe Andy Williams singing it. So they said, well, show us what you mean. So I went home called Tony Banks. I said, what are the chords of Groovy Kind of Love? And he told me. And I made a little demo. And I, I, I sent it to them. I said, this is the kind of thing I mean. So um, I said, uh, you know, not me. This, this is, a, you know, just a, an idea. So when I went to see a rough cut of the film, as, you know, I'm saying goodbye to Julie, giving, giving her a kiss goodbye, my demo comes on. And I said, but this is not what I meant. And they said, but it works, doesn't it? <laughs> it's that film thing, you know, like, yeah, but it's good, isn't it? And I said, yeah. Well, it was so good, it topped the charts on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, I had to re-record it properly and rest is buster history. When I'm feeling blue If you could go back to the 80s and make things different, what would you change? Would there be less Phil Collins on the radio? What would you do differently? Well, I think less Phil Collins on the radio might have averted the backlash and the being and being slightly the whipping boy of the 80s of, uh, you know, how can I miss you if you don't go away kind of thing. But um, I don't know if I'd change anything, really. Because it's almost, you apologise for being on the radio all the time. Well, it's not my fault. It's like having to apologise for success. Fault, <laughs> it is your fault, It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the song once. This is what I've started to say now. I mean, I wrote the song once, and I recorded it once. The fact that people played it to death on the radio kind of isn't my fault. And yet, I mean, this is a sort of one way of looking at it. Of course... It was wonderful to be in people's lives. I just think it added to that fact of the omnipresent smarty pants, why doesn't he go away kind of image that um, that I started to get. Was it unfair or did you deserve any of it? Oh, I think I deserved it because it, it, it happened. I was on the radio the whole time. I was everywhere. You know, I'm sure... Not necessarily the public, but journalists who write in newspapers for people that have kind of on the fence or hadn't heard it, you start to read a lot of bad stuff or a lot, a lot of negative stuff anyway. I think I probably deserved it. I mean, one thing that doesn't help, really, because somebody, your mum must have said you can't please all the people all the time, Phil. Hmm. But if you got a bad review, you'd ring up the writer and sort of have a go. I did that a few times, yeah. Yeah, there were journalists in America who... It was reviews of shows, you know, when you played to 25,000 people and they all loved it and it was a great show and everyone home, went home feeling good. And then in the morning you'd read this awful review and, and in Indianapolis, I can remember, this review that, that listed up a few people that weren't in the band and listed some songs we didn't play... And it was almost, it wasn't the same place, you know. Couldn't you have developed a tougher skin? Yes, I could have. I could have. You think about the 25,000 who loved it? Yes. That's what I did become. I'm much more like that now. It's, you know, in the same way I used to listen to the shows after the show, just to see if there was anything that we could improve on. Now I really realise it's a moment in time. It happened, 
it was good. And there are people that may not like it, but I can't do anything about that. I'm better now, Doctor. I promise. <laughs> Well, that's the benefit of growing a bit older, isn't it? You don't worry so much about what other people think about yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got nothing to say about it. <laughs> I'm better. Good. So you've met a few royals along the way. Prince Charles's 40th birthday party. Yes. I've been involved with Prince's Trust since 83, maybe earlier. And I used to go to a lot of events. Or They came, Charles and I used to come to our, our shows because we gave the proceeds to the trust. And um, I went to a, a lot of concerts and film premieres with them because that's the way we raised money. But one day we were sitting in Wembley at a Michael Jackson concert and he, um, somewhere during the concert, Prince Charles turned around to me and said, I'd like this music at my party, this kind of music. So I said, uh, certainly, sir. So would you organise that? <laughs> so <laughs> suddenly I'm like thinking, what the? All right, so I went home having to organise Prince of Wales's 40th birthday. So I got on the phone to my agent, well, an agent that I knew, told him the situation. He sent me some cassette tapes. So I went through all these tapes, you know, of people that could play Beat It and things like this, and I booked one decided on one and we went to the you know I got summoned to the palace to have a run through at the birthday party and Nigel who was the um, leader of the Royal Blues which is the name of the group that I'd chosen he said to me uh, actually we played at his 21st birthday party so I kind of thought they might be good but um, I was the surprise act and although everyone knew I was coming <laughs> But um, when it came to my turn, I came out on stage, you know, and it was quite intimidating. I mean, Princess Diana was, was in the middle at the front and standing and, uh, and all these royal, you know, kings and queens across Europe that had come to, for the party were standing, you know, around her. Across the side of the stage was Elton with Fergie, you know, talking about clothes, I guess. <laughs> And uh, I was with Daryl Sturman, my guitar player, and we played. We, you know, when you when you're playing in just a couple of you, there's only certain songs that you can play that sound good. So I put together a song list of of you know mainly ballads, and um, started to sing. You know, and I was singing Separate Lives, and uh, doesn't anybody say together anymore? And uh, you know. So, uh, what I found out later to be completely inappropriate songs for a couple that were just about to divorce, and um, which I knew nothing about. And then we finished our set, and I went home. But before I did, I went and introduced myself to the Queen, just because I hadn't met her, and I thought, you know, this is an opportunity. So I went up and said, Your Highness, pleased to meet you. And first of all, you're supposed to say Your Majesty, right? You know, you could get your head cut off for that. So I, I said, Your Highness, and she didn't seem to mind at all. And she said, oh, you're my son's friend. I said, yes. And we had a, a little couple of, couple of seconds. And then I went to get a drink, and I saw her and Prince Philip jiving to rock around the clock, which was, you know, something I won't forget. And, uh, and then I left. And later, you know, they have carriages at uh, one or something like that. And uh, my crew are, are, are kind of, you know, waiting for everyone to go so they can get the gear out. So they get some plates of dip beans and chips and sausages and, you know, whatever, mash. And they're walking around trying to find the place to sit. And uh, they find three seats and they sit down and, you know, couple of burly guys in here and uh, it's the queen sitting there on her own yeah. and she said uh, oh, they you know our guy said so, sorry sorry and she said don't be so silly don't be so silly sit down so my crew had uh, had breakfast with the queen and it was a very entertaining experience i have to say the whole the whole uh, event come stop you crying
To win an Oscar for You'll Be In My Heart must have been a wonderful moment. Of course, you know, being British as well. I just didn't think it was going to come my way. I'd been nominated three times and uh, it hadn't happened. So I was thrilled, I've got to say. When Cher opened the envelope and read my name out, it was, I couldn't believe that it had happened. So it was one of the, one of the highlights of my musical career, I think. Did you have a speech prepared? No, I just had, uh, I mean, you know, I hate that. that <laughs> when people say, what an incredible surprise and bring out a ream of paper, you know. Yes. No, I, I, I knew I had, if I got lucky, I knew I had some people to thank. But no, it was, it was lovely. It was lovely. Let's talk about uh, the the song "One More Night." The sort of the power of the of the ballad. What's it like for you singing and writing ballads? Is it, is it more emotion goes into it than if you're doing a much more up tempo thing? Yeah, I think you can skim over some things with 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 up tempo stuff. I mean, everything counts still, but you can skim over it. I mean, it all starts from when I put my hands on the keyboards and what kind of noise I'll make. I react to sound of the keyboard, and and so something will take shape from from what you're playing. Yeah, I mean, there's I would say there's more emotion that goes into the ballads because they're, they're the ones that people tend to listen to the lyrics quite closely. What about you dealing with other people's emotions? Were you good at that? In what way, you mean? Do you kind of have an empathy or an understanding for other people's feelings oh yeah well I, I i i yeah i think that other people tend to um i mean people tend to react to what i've written because i'm writing as if it happened to them i mean a lot of the things that have happened to, to, to me are things that happen to everybody and i write it in such a way that it's probably easier to understand there's different ways of songwriting. I mean, Paul Simon, for example, will write a song where you really have to go in and, and dig to find out maybe what the song is really about. Whereas it's you don't have to dig too deep with me. You're listening to Phil Collins here on Radio 2. The album title, No Jacket Required. Why did Robert Plant get into a restaurant and you don't, even though you're wearing a jacket? Was he wearing a better jacket than you were? He was wearing a suit, a willy wear suit, which was actually, you know, quite loud checks. Um, but I had a leather jacket on and I believe I had jeans on, but, you know, I, I, they weren't scruffy jeans and it was a brand new leather jacket. But, you know, this is... <laughs> I sound like a complainer, don't I? I mean, uh, fact is, we, we, you know, we went down there for a drink in the um, the pump room on the in the Ambassador East Hotel in Chicago. For those of you that want to visit, just take a jacket. Yes, <laughs> but it gives you an album title. It did, did yeah, it did. There's a, there's a, another thing that happened around the same time when I was on holiday in St John with Jill and. We went, you know, and it, this is a, a Caribbean island with an open restaurant, you know, bamboo roof. And I went there and, I, and we were waiting in line. And the guy said, sorry, sir, you have to have a jacket. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm on holiday. I mean, so anyway, I said, sorry. And the couple in front of me turned around and said, no jacket required. Huh? <laughs> and I got to, I mean, I'm still in touch with with the the wife i mean the, the the other the doctor he died a few years ago but i'm still in touch with the family and um in fact i told them that, that they were in the book <laughs> because i mentioned that story in the book but it gave me an album title as you say and we not mentioned another day in paradise that's all right yeah <laughs> <laughs> still a great track though isn't it <laughs> yes i mean you know i'm we talked about criticism. It seems that the criticism you got for Another Day in Paradise, that somehow if you're successful, you're not allowed to have a political view about something. Yes, it, it baffled me a little bit because I think the actual lyrics are saying that Another Day for You and Me 
I mean, whatever whatever situation we're in, we are in a much better situation than these guys and women sleeping in boxes. That was my simple approach to it. And I did my bit for the homeless shelters and the... Uh, I can hold my head up about it, but it, it was strange. I think that that was all part of this Phil Collins whipping boy thing that... But I think actually to withdraw... If you can you know, forget about that side of it, I think that the song certainly um, focused on something that needed to be focused on. And uh, homeless shelters, they all wanted to use it at their conferences and they all wanted to get involved because they were proud of the song as well. So it all turned out well in the end. She calls out to the Your first wife, Auntie, I guess she turns up in Invisible Touch, does she? <laughs> you met when you were 11, didn't you? Uh, 13, really, yeah. 13. Um, she was one of the girls at the Barbara Speak yes. Drama School? Well, I mean, in, in, Invisible Touch is not so much specifically about her. It's as just as specifically about the other person that was at Barbara Speaks Stage School, which is Lavinia, who features quite heavily in the book. Just girlfriends that, you know, kind of, you never forget, but aren't necessarily good for you. But, but I mean, good for you in, in the kind of very broad sense. But... You can't resist them. Can't resist them, yes. And uh, so, yeah... Invisible touch. She seems to have an invisible touch. She'll come in and mess up your life and you're never quite the same. <laughs> of course, there are, other, there are probably other women before these two write in. <laughs> well, I've been waiting, waiting. That's Genesis and uh, Invisible Touch. Huge hit and also huge tour. Now you see groups like Fleetwood Mac that do, do a show, day off, do a show, day off. Mm. But you just, back then, it was like every night, not a show, yeah. every night. Yes, it, we tried to get work it out as to what would be the best thing for the voice, you know, because, I mean, sometimes you have to have a few days off for the equipment to get from A to B. But um, we tried everything. We tried like two shows on, one night off, three shows on, one night off. And then back in the early 80s, we did 11 shows in nine days. We did a gig every night, plus two shows on one night and two shows on another night. And that was fine too. So it's impossible sometimes, unless you get sick. But if you're doing, sometimes just going on, it's vocal tiredness. That's what bothers me, not physical tiredness. Because once you get out on stage, you forget about the physical tiredness. It's if you get sick. I mean, sometimes even the, vote, uh, even the voice rather, can straighten itself out during a show. There are no hard and fast rules. You talk in the book about getting away from the excess that Genesis had become. What do you mean by that? The excess? Yeah, too many shows, too many tours. Well, I, I mean, I, you've got to remember. I mean, you just said Fleetwood Mac do night on, night off. I had two gigs. I had my career, which had its own long tours, and then, you know, a, a break and then an album. And then that album would be followed by a Genesis album and a, a Genesis long tour, because by the time we got to a Genesis project, they'd have been doing nothing, probably, enjoying themselves, probably, uh, while I was working on my thing. And that just got too much, I think. It's a lot of a lot of strain and a lot of work. Uh, well, I'm not scared of work, we know that, but it was never-ending. Is it ever possible for a rock musician, a successful one, to have a happy marriage? I mean, it, you're away so much of the time. They're living their life, you're living your life, they're completely different, and then suddenly you come back together and you're supposed to be able to get on. 
Well, I don't think it, 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 it should be that difficult. I mean... Do you feel you've failed because you had three marriages? Part of me does, yeah. I never fooled around on the road. You know, I, I was always married. I mean, there was the Lavinia episode, of course, you know. But, no, I mean, it's difficult to say, you know. I, I mean, I always did say that my career didn't break my relationships up. But looking back and having done the book, I would say putting it all together. I mean, one of the hardest things was just addressing your mistakes every day. Oh, God, we're going to do Faxgate today. You know, or, oh, God, we're going to do this, this chapter today. And it all, you know, it all needed to be said. But uh, at the same time, I probably wouldn't change anything. Having dealt with it in the book, has that in a way that it, you'd be able to put it more in the past? So you're more at peace with yourself now? Well, I hope so, but, I mean, Andy, Jill and Orianne haven't read it yet, so I'm sure I've got... I'm sure I've got some flack to come from someone. But I've, I, I have tried to be... Well, I have just tried. I have been very delicate and I've admitted my mistakes and if my ex-partners are going to read it... I think they will be pleased that I have addressed it in a dignified way. I mean, you can't please all the people all the time, but it's, it's my life, you know. I mean, I think the kids will read it and say, OK, I didn't know that, didn't know that. Good old Dad. I think they've all thought bad things of me at any particular time when this kind of stuff has happened. But reading about it, I think, will make it make more sense. Find yourself in the gutter. And you mentioned in your book one time going out for a weekend to make Rod Stewart jealous in the model railway department. Oh. Was that just a, a fleeting thing or you still got a... No, I, I did it for, a, you know, I, mean, I did it in England when I was living in England and then when I moved... I, I boxed it all up and I took it to Switzerland and it really started again, frankly, because, you know, once you've done this thing, once I mean, I'm not interested in looking at the trains go around, OK? I like to build the scenery. That's something, I, even when I was a kid, I used to like building models. So um, once you've done that, it starts to get a little bit busy because you keep adding to it and that's, that's the point where you kind of stop. So I boxed all that up, and that's in storage because I needed the room for these Alamo things, which was growing fast. So, uh, no, I'm not... I'm sure Roddy's got a, a better one than me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Phil, great to see you. Great to see you too, Janet, always. Yeah, thanks for coming in. How can I just let you walk away? My thanks to Phil Collins and producer Mark Simpson.